Clostridium botulinum. It is a gram-positive rod. Rods are kind of rectangular, long in shape as the ones you can see in this picture. You might be thinking, what is this one? I'll talk about that in morphology section. Clostridium botulinum is an obligate anaerobe. That means that it can live in the absence or in less oxygen. This bacterium is also responsible for forming spores, but we can say that Clostridium botulinum is fastidious spore former. It forms spores in the conditions where it finds it difficult for it to survive. This bacterium is responsible for causing botulism, which is commonly known as flaccid paralytic disease. We're going to discuss why this is termed as flaccid paralytic disease, not just the paralytic, in the pathogenesis section. This bacterium is motile. This bacterium is responsible for producing the toxin that plays a major role in the pathogenesis of botulism. It belongs to the family of Clostridia. In this picture, you can clearly see the picture of Clostridium botulinum, this one. These circular opacities, these are the spores, and this one, the rod and the spore together. This is the form between the spore and the rod form. There the bacterium is trying to convert into the spore or the spore is trying to convert into the bacterium. Assalamu alaikum everybody, hope you all are doing well. In today's video, we are going to talk about Clostridium botulinum in detail. If you have missed my other videos on Clostridium, be sure to check them out. But before getting into the video, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comments section. Grab a pen and a notepad and let's get started. Clostridia. It has got following fruit species. The first one is Clostridium perfringens. The second one is Clostridium tetani. The third one is Clostridium botulinum. And the last one is Clostridium difficile. But before getting into the detail of Clostridium botulinum, we should know about the classification of bacteria. Bacteria are further classified into sporocytes or keats in some places. It is also classified on the basis of acid fast stain into acid fast bacteria. And there's also an exception that is the mycoplasma bacterium. On the basis of gram staining, bacteria are further classified into gram negative and gram positive. We are not concerned here with gram negative as the Clostridium botulinum is gram positive. So let's talk about that. If you want to know more about bacterial classification, the link to the video is in the description. I hope you like it. Let's talk about the gram positive. They're further classified into cocci and rods. Rods are further classified into spore-forming rods and non-spore-forming rods. Non-spore-forming rods are further subdivided into filamentous and non-filamentous. But the spore-forming rods are further classified into aerobic, for example bacillus, and anaerobic, for example clostridium. Both the aerobic and anaerobic rods are further classified into motile and non-motile ones. The aerobic motile is bacillus cereus and the Aerobic non-motile is Bacillus anthracis, while the anaerobic non-motile is Clostridium perfringens. I've got a detailed video on that. Find its link in the description. And anaerobic motile rods are Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulinum, the topic of today's video, and Clostridium difficile. Lecture outline. We are done with the introduction and classification. Now we'll be looking at morphology, habitat in transmission, pathogenesis, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology. This bacterium is rod-shaped, as you can see in this picture. Size. This bacterium varies in width from 0.5 to 2 micrometers and 1.6 to 22 micrometers in length. It is purple or blue in color. Why? As it's gram-positive, its thick peptidoglycan layer will retain the dye and it will be purple. This bacterium is encapsulated. Right now we're talking about the structure of Clostridium botulinum. It is motile, it is responsible for forming spores and it produces a toxin that is botulinum toxin. Now you can clearly see this is the rod-shaped bacterium. This is the spore inside the bacterium and this is how the sea botulinum looks like under the microscope. Now let's talk about the toxin before talking about the pathogenesis as we know that this toxin is going to play a major role in the pathogenesis of botulism. 
This is a neurotoxin and it is heat labile. It is resistant to enzymes and low pH. It inhibits the transport of acetylcholine across the cell membrane. You know, I might be thinking how. Okay, let me tell you. It is a protease that leaves the proteins involved in the acetylcholine release. This toxin is a polypeptide and it is encoded by a lysogenic phase. Along with tetanus toxin, it is among the most toxic substances known. Let's talk about its immunologic types. There are a total of eight, but in some places you might find them seven. The A, B, and E are the most common ones and they're involved in the human illnesses. Botox is a commercial preparation of exotoxin A and that is used to remove wrinkles in the face. Minute amounts of this toxin are also effective in the treatment of certain spasmodic muscle disorders such as writer's cramp. Habitate. Hosts. Humans and animals are the hosts. Sources. Spores are widespread in the soil. They can also be found in contaminated vegetables and meat. Let me tell you one really high yield thing there. It is that the Clostridium botulinum can survive better in alkaline environments as compared to acidic. If you find a food that is in alkaline environments, let's say alkaline wedges, this wedgie might have the Clostridium botulinum in it. And if you change the pH and you make this vegetable acidic by adding some of the citric acid like from lemon, this bacterium won't be able to survive there and humans will not get infected. There are certain other foods like canned or vacuum packed foods. Um, the reason behind these foods is that if there is not adequate sterilization or the foods prior to canning um, are not cleansed properly, there might be spores there and there will be alkaline environment and spores will survive there and they will germinate in that anaerobic environment and that will also lead to the infection because humans will consume that food and there are some other foods like smoked fish and honey honey is kind of vacuum packed food what happens when honey is packed there might be some spores inside the honey bottle when an infant is given that honey having the clostridium botulinum spores it will definitely cause botulism in the infant and that will be termed as what the infant botulism types of botulism there are four major types of botulism, but the top three are most common. First one is infant botulism. Don't think that botulism is restricted to infants. Adults can be infected. And that one is called adult or foodborne botulism. And there's also wound botulism and inhalational botulism. I've mentioned the types of botulism prior to talking about the transmission as I usually do in my videos. The reason behind it is that on the basis of transmission, there are different types of botulism. If spores or the bacteria are ingested by an infant, like in case of honey, this will be termed as infant botulism. If an adult ate the food, like the canned food or vacuum-packed food, adult would get infection. But in case of adult, there are no spores. There is a preformed toxin present in food that is ingested. That's why it is foodborne botulism. And when spores enter into a wound, that's common in drug abusers. This is wound botulism. And what is inhalational botulism? It is when spores are inhaled. Pathogenesis. Let's talk about the story behind the botulism. Number one step is the entrance of the toxin in the body. And we've discussed that in transmission. After the entry, what happens, it reaches the gut. And then the botulinum toxin is absorbed from the gut. If you might be thinking, okay, if the infant got the bacteria and the spores, are you talking about toxin now? Why? Okay, let me tell you. When spores will get in the human body, what will happen? They will germinate into the bacteria and bacteria will release this toxin. And same goes for bacteria. Bacteria will release the toxin. So when the toxin is present in the human gut, this will be absorbed and will be carried via blood to peripheral nervous system where it blocks the release of acetylcholine. Here comes the virulence factors and the major virulence factor here is the botulinum toxin. This is a protease. It means that it's an enzyme that cleaves proteins. It cleaves a specific 
protein that is snare protein. Why this protein is so specific, let me tell you. This protein plays a really important role in the transfer of neurotransmitters like acetylcholine that leads to neuromuscular activity or contraction in the muscles. When this botulinum toxin will cleave that protein. This will not allow the release of acetylcholine from one neuron to another neuron. Look, this is one neuron and this is synaptic cleft. This is the area of synapses. Normally what happens is that acetylcholine is released and it goes and is taken up by the receptors of the postsynaptic neuron. But what happens when there is botulinum toxin, it will not allow the release of acetylcholine. Why? It will cleave that protein that leads to the release of that acetylcholine. So what will happen when the release of acetylcholine is prevented from presynaptic axon terminal, it will cause inhibition of neuromuscular neurotransmission. Clinical findings. There are many things when we talk about Clostridium botulinum. The top one in the list is autonomic symptoms. These are xerostomia, that's a fancy word for mouth dryness. There's another thing that is dysautonomia. Then we've also got some bulbar symptoms like dysarthria or dysphagia. There are also cranial nerve palsies that lead to diplopia, myrdiasis, ptosis, lack of pupillary accommodation and there's a really risky thing that's a respiratory muscle failure. Here comes a talk of muscle contraction when there's no muscular activity, neuromuscular activity, there will be no muscle contraction, there are muscles present in a respiratory tract. When they will not contract at the time when they're supposed to after relaxation and they will be relaxed for a long time that will lead to what? That will lead to respiratory distress and then arrest and that will cause death. Clostridium botulinum can also cause descending flaccid paralysis. This is kind of descending weakness. It is present in ocular, pharyngeal, laryngeal regions and also respiratory. That can lead to death. There is no fever present and there are certain other symptoms like eyelid drooping, floppy baby syndrome, neonatal hypotonis. You might be thinking what is floppy baby syndrome? Okay when a baby is infected with the botulism there is no proper contraction of the muscles. There is inhibition of neuromuscular activity due to the um, no release of acetylcholine that will cause the floppy baby syndrome. Baby will not be able to voluntarily move his muscles. That's why this uh, disease is termed as floppy baby syndrome. There will be certain gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and constipation. There will be constipation because there's no proper contraction of smooth muscles in the intestine. And constipation is common in babies. Let's talk about these three and their symptoms. The infant botulism is the most common one and that occurs due to the spore ingestion. And it is associated with honey or soil when it is ingested by the infant. And the affected infants develop weakness or paralysis and may need a respiratory support. But the thing is that the mortality rate in infants is not as high as we might think. The second one is wound botulism. Here what happens, spores contaminate the wound and they germinate and produce a toxin at sight and then the toxin reaches the blood and from blood it goes to the peripheral nervous system and all of the pathogenesis is repeated like the inhibition of acetylcholine release and inhibition of neuromuscular neurotransmission that leads to the botulism. And this one is associated mainly with intravenous drug abuse. The third one is foodborne botulism. And that is due to the ingestion of preformed toxin that is associated with canned foods like tuna fish or vacuum packed foods. Lab diagnosis. We'll need samples from wound site, we'll need sample of feces, serum, the patient's eaten food from his gut. We may need some samples of GI tract. We'll go for microscopy on gram staining. It was revealed that this bacterium is gram positive because of its purple or blue color. It is rod shaped under microscopy. It varies in weight from 0.5 to 2 micrometers and in length from 1.6 to 22 micrometers. It is purple or blue in color. As you can see here, 
this is the bacterium and these are the spores it is rod shaped and this bacterium having the opacity this one is converting into spore in unfavorable condition or the spore when finding the favorable conditions is converting back into bacterium and this is how the Clostridium botulinum looks like under the microscope this organism is usually not cultured and is diagnosed based on clinical presentation of the patient but the botulinum toxin is demonstrable in uneaten food and the patient's serum by mouse protection tests mice are inoculated with a sample of clinical specimen and will die unless protected by antitoxin and there are certain tests like ELISA in enzyme linked immunosorbent assay and they are used for diagnosis of the toxin and certain PCR tests. They are used to detect the DNA encoding the toxin. Treatment. Prior to talking about the treatment, we should know what will be the plan. The first thing we need to give the patient suffering from botulism will be respiratory or ventilator support. The second one is going to be trivalent botulinum antitoxin. The third one will be antibiotics for infant botulism. The botulism immune globulin is used. For the treatment of wound botulism, antitoxin is used, but there's also surgical debridement of wound. For adult or foodborne botulism, antitoxin is used and there is a medication induced bowel emptying. To remove the food having the preformed toxin from the bowel of the patient to prevent the disease occurrence. And definitely will go for respiratory support. Prevention. Proper sterilization of all canned and vacuum-packed foods is essential. Food must be adequately cooked to inactivate the toxin. Maintenance of food pH means the maintenance of food in acidic pH is really important. We can use certain citrus foods like lime to maintain the acidic pH of our foods. And swollen and damaged cans must be discarded. In case of babies, honeys should be avoided to prevent the occurrence of infant botulism. And there is a formally treated toxoid vaccine that works against botulism. It has serotypes A to E. And it was first used, but now it is discontinued. Alright guys, let's review everything in this short table. We've discussed Clostridium botulinum today. It is responsible for causing botulism and that is flaccid or the descending paralysis. It is transmitted via ingestion, wound entry. Hosts are humans and animals and sources are soil, contaminated vegetables, meat, alkaline vegetables, canned or vacuum packed food, smoked fish and also honey. A diagnosis is based on gram staining, microscopy, mouse protection tests, ELISA and also PCR. For treatment we'll go for botulism immune globulin, surgical debridement in case of wound botulism, we'll also go for antitoxin and medication induced ball emptying and respiratory support and that's it for today's video i hope you enjoyed it if you've got any suggestions feel free to leave them below in the comments and i'll catch you in the next video till then assalamu alaikum